There is this powerful alignment in the truths that keep reoccurring over yes. and over. Understanding the fleeting quality of life, understanding not to be dominated by external situations, understanding the power of equanimity. It's inspiring to me that we're moving in a similar direction. I'm a big fan also. I um, We sell this book at my bookstore and people love it. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah I've of been, course. I've been following you for, um, I think, maybe like six years. Like, it's been a long no way. time. Yeah, for sure. Oh, that's very cool. Well, I, I saw we've been uh, we've been uh, trading back and forth on the uh, on the bestseller <laughs> list. So that's fun also. I know. We're, we're both very uh, fortunate people. <laughs> Not as fortunate as James Clear, uh, who seems to be uh, just perpetually there. It's uh, but congrats on number one. That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, James is a juggernaut, and rightfully so. You know, he's he, he created something incredible. But um, it, it's so funny to see um, how much it takes to get him off of number one for one week. <laughs> yeah, no. I, I want to talk to you about that because uh, I want I want to hear what it felt like to you to hit it. But there is something humbling about like you, you work for months and months on this launch. You, uh, you, you sell like more copies than you thought you would ever sell. And then you just get beaten by somebody just having an ordinary week, you know, like, like just his, his is like week. <laughs> h- 150 consecutive weeks. And it's like, oh yeah, sorry, I beat you. Um, it, it, it is a reminder one, I think of, uh, how powerful something can be as you're saying, but also, the thing that you think is your greatest accomplishment could just be an ordinary week to someone else, which is why comparison sucks. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it really sucks. And then, and then you think about all of us compared to Colleen Hoover and it's nothing. (laughs) That's true. That's true. There's all, there's always somebody who is doing more than you and not just doing like a little bit more than you. And you're like, if I stretch, I think I can get there. You're just like, no, no, this person is several feet taller than you. Yeah, I actually checked her out on Publishers Weekly, and I think a number of her books had sold like 40,000 copies that week, like yeah. six of her books. And it was just like outrageous. <laughs> what, so what did it feel like to hit number one? Because, I mean, you, you've, you've hit the list many times. Uh, you sold a lot of books. You have large numbers of followers. But hitting number one is a thing. I don't know if this is the first time for you, but what, what, what was the sensation that you felt when that happened? Um, it was the first time hitting number one and it was totally, um, unexpected. Um, we, I just, I just didn't really see it coming cause I know the New York times has their own way of going about things. And, um, and I've heard of a lot of different stories. Like I've heard of like Tim Ferriss's story of, you know, selling a hundred thousand and getting number four. Yeah. And, and, um, so I was like, okay, like it just doesn't matter to me, like trying my best to just let it go. And like, I've hit it before with Clarity and Connection. And I was basically just telling myself and my editor being like, look, I'm just trying to get the book in as many hands as possible. If we get somewhere on the list, great. But when we got number one, I was just like, um, it just felt surreal. It was just, um, you know, that's that's like the thing that authors, that's like the prize that, yeah. that we kind of um, have as a, as a potential. It's a gold medal. Yeah. <laughs> but, was it um, anticlimactic yeah. at all? Um, no, it just took days to process. It took days. Mm. Like it was like, you know, it happened. And then my wife and I were just like, wow, but we were like in the middle of everything, you know, everything was still happening and going in the middle of the release and had a bunch of things to do. And it wasn't until like when I was number two that I was like really celebrating number one. (laughs) Oh, the, the, the the next week it, it became clear the difference between one and two. Yeah. Yeah. So we just flipped sides and went to number two. Interesting. Yeah, the, I I think when it happened, it happened for me on stillness. It should it, it should have happened for me on discipline. I sold more than James that week. Uh, it, ordinary week for him, not not ordinary for me. But because I sold them through my own bookstore, a good chunk of the copies they they probably scrubbed like twenty thousand copies from the total number. Oh no. Um, which, yeah. which I knew going in, I think this is one of the problems when we like, we say we don't care about something that we're like, mm-hmm. you were like, I just want to reach as many people as possible. But then secretly we want to have, we want to eat our cake and have it too. Right. Like yeah. we say yeah. we don't care about what other people think, but we do. And we, d- we don't want to do anything to get what people think to be positive, but then we're hurt when we don't get it. So like, 
I, I think um, I knew what I was doing uh, and I knew that it was reducing my odds. And yet there's still there's still some part of you that's like, well, why didn't I get this thing? But when I got it for for stillness, I remember thinking, okay, this doesn't feel exactly how I thought. Like, I don't know if I thought the heavens would part and my dad yeah. would call me and finally, like, we would be <laughs> good. And then I would feel like, not like a 17 year old who doesn't know their place in high school anymore. What, like, <laughs> I felt like all that would go away, but then you're still you. I mean, you're still the same person that you've always been. No one throws you a parade. Yeah. And it's, and it's interesting because it's so fleeting. Like it's, yes. it's done, you know, it happened and now it's sort of like what comes next. And I think um, I'm always trying to be really careful of falling into the trap of just craving for more, craving for more. Like, don't get me wrong. I want to be a good writer. That's something that I try to like hold myself to and be like, okay, for my next book, how can I make something that's even more useful for people? Yeah. And, but at the end of the day, it's like, there, there's just always more, you know, craving is relentless. So being okay with, you know, appreciating what's happening now, I feel like, especially at this point in my career, um, cause I'm almost at, at that personal other mark for authors when like, um, all together, all your books sell 1 million copies yeah. and I'm like right below that mark now. So it's like, oh. that's like the next hurdle that's coming up and I'm um, thinking about that and being like, okay, like that's a, you know, it's a great mark to reach. And, but then what comes after that? Is there just more craving or can I just like focus on being productive? Well, one, one thing I think books, uh, as obviously we're getting a little inside baseball here, but I think one lesson that people who are not authors can take from what we're talking about is that, okay, yes, there is this list, although we're in this sort of ghetto list called the advice how to miscellaneous. Yeah. Anytime, anytime your accomplishment <laughs> is, is lumped together miscellaneous, you know, you're, you're already, they're already saying there's something weird about it. Um, yeah. but, but like, uh, the people on the list, like if I pull up where you were, it's like you, uh, me, uh, James Clear, uh, and like a bunch of other very different things. So like very the, different. It, 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 there's even one cook, finish, even cookbooks. Yeah, it's a finish line, but there's really 10 different races happening on this list. And so like for you to have sold a million books is not the same for me to have sold a million books. It's not the same for James to have sold a million books because a million books about habits versus a million books about an obscure school of ancient philosophy versus a million books of poetry in 2022. Mm -hmm. This is, these are not just apples and oranges. Like these are different galaxies or universes that, that we are existing in, our craft is existing in, and the audience is interested in, is, is existing in. And so when we compare ourselves to other people, it's fundamentally unfair to them and us because we're doing very different things. Yeah. And it's also a changing situation, right? Like in terms of like, I was hearing it a lot from my editor when he was just like, you know, the way things work now, and what the New York Times wants from you and how they want you to sell books and where they want you to sell books and have it all neatly spread out. It's just not realistic in these like post-COVID times where everyone's just online. You yeah. know, like, we, I don't want to be around that many people and <laughs> yeah. all of that. So it's just, um, even when we were designing the tour, like the launch of it all, and like I went out and did, I did um, have one more uh, event. I did three in-person events and it was just a whole different experience where, instead of signing books for people, you know, signing books ahead of time so that they could leave with a signed copy. But um, all of it would just felt very new. And I think it's a pretty transitional period for like, how we can even measure the success of a book going forward. Well, it, you, you said something interesting where you said it's so fleeting, and it is fleeting. You know, there's the, the, the Latin expression, uh, sick transit, Gloria Mundi, all glory is fleeting. And it mm -hmm. does, it doesn't last. And yet, right? Because like, you're, you're number one for seven days. And then now you're number two. <laughs> and then it almost certainly, again, unless you're James Clear, it's, it's a one directional march, right? Like you're heading yeah. down, <laughs> you're down from here. Um, and, and that's true. And yet also, so, so there's some humility in looking at it this way, like, Hey, you're the president for four years. You're number one in the world for one year, whatever. But the other way to look at it is you've also done it forever, right? Like you can, it can never be taken away from you that you did it. And so I think yeah. it depends on ultimately like how we choose to see things. Do we look at this sort of 
perpetual competition. And if we're not number one, we're not measuring up and we're less than, or do you go, I'm, I'm an Olympic gold medalist, right? Like yeah. I am an Academy Award nominated actor. I did that. You can't take that away from me. And you, no one can also take away from the fact, putting aside the external recognition, that you wrote a book that was good, that was in, even yeah, in contention yeah. to be one of these things. You know, it's funny. It, it makes me think back to, like, I um, I once was talking to this teacher that I really revere and um, hold in high esteem. And I was telling him that, you know, I wasn't going to be able to do as many meditation courses this year because I'm really focusing on my career and whatnot. And he was like, look, he was like, don't think of it as two different things. Like mm. you do a good job in here in these courses to do a good job in your life. And you do a good job in your life to do a good job in here. And the thing that really just struck me was he looked at me and he's like, be the best. Yeah. Not in the sense of competition, not in the sense of what others are doing, but you be the best. And that's what ended up just hitting me and made me really reflect and think, you know, okay, let me not worry so much about what other people are doing, but let me just put out the best thing that I can possible. And let's see what that is able to do. Yeah, I think about that. Actually, I have a chapter about this in the discipline book. Uh, Pompey the Great goes to see uh, one of the Stoic philosophers. It's, it's uh, I think it's uh, Panateus or uh, Posidonius. And he, and he says, what, what advice do you have to me? And this is in the moment when Pompey is, literally his name is the great. He's like the yeah, most Pompey powerful. Magnus, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's quite a name, right? To, to have that in your lifetime, you know? Um, and uh, he says to him, he says, my advice to you, and he's quoting the Odyssey, the Odyssey, and he says, be best and always superior to others. But, but Pompey takes this as, you know, like win the most battles. But, mm. but, but what he means is to, to be great, like to be great as a human being, not as an accomplished person. And I think sometimes we, we mistake those things or we, it's easy to look at the measurable evidence of say greatness or success, right? You're like, Hey, I'm the number one best selling author in the world this week or, or the United States this week. We often, we're not more people in China. I'm sure they sold more books. Um, but, <laughs> but, uh, were you the best writer this week? And I don't even mean mm -hmm. the published work, but like, did you show up and do the work this week? Do you know what I mean? And that's when, when they, when the Stokes talk about being best, I think that's what they mean. Like the, the, did you do the work like now? Not, not the lagging indicator, which is the external recognition that comes from a thing that you haven't touched in six months. Yeah. And, and, and it's funny because for most of us, like, um, like I was so inspired by the, the video that you put out, you know, with your, um, I love that you, you were able to capture that moment with, um, I don't know if it was your agent or someone yeah. reaching out to you, telling you that you got the, um, yeah. number two spot, sold 60,000 copies. And I, I was like, dang, I was like, I'm literally in the same place. Like I'm in the middle of writing two books right now. And, and I just, you know, got the number one, but it's like, okay, well, I'm still, you know, I'm going to savor this moment, but at the same time, I'm trying to just keep it going because I know this is, this is the moment. Like, it feels like this is the right time for me to put out a number of books about different topics that are important to me. And, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do in the future. Like I'll figure out what I'm going to do, but I feel like this is the project and everything's hot right now. So let me continue with it and, sure. and do my best. Yeah. So, so putting aside the bestseller list, I, I wonder if it's difficult for you, like I've said this before, that social media gives human beings way too much data, like an unhealthy amount of data, <laughs> yeah. right? So if I think of poetry as this kind of, I don't want to say like, uh, it, it seems a little bit immune to the market or removed from the market in that, you know, it's this sort of ancient art form. It's mm -hmm. it's no, certainly no longer cutting edge on like on the, as far as like transgressive pop culture, um, you know, less people read poetry now than probably did 200 years ago. Um, and yet you're making poetry because of the, the, the mediums that you've tapped into so powerfully. Right. But like when you publish a poem, like they give you a number, <laughs> like how many people viewed it, but then <laughs> they also give you a number of how many people liked it, how many people shared it, how many, you know, how many people immediately clicked away, how many people commented on it. How do you think about doing this kind of, artistic, strange art form, 
but then also wrestling with this very precise, almost scientific amount of data that you're barraged with. You know, it's, it's, um, it's funny because in some ways there's a upside to it and downside it's, you do get, um, to learn if you're actually reaching people, if like you're making sense, yeah. like, does this make sense? And to me that early on in my career, that was really important because when I started writing, I spent the first three years just like developing my voice as a writer, like knowing like, okay, I'm not trying to put out a book immediately. I'm just trying to figure out how to write and also what are my major topics. And as I sort of like, you know, grew in a smaller incubator with like, you know, 10,000, 20,000 followers and just learned about how I can better say things when it got bigger and it got over a million, over 1.5 million, 2 million, it just, it was just too much. So recently my relationship with the data was just that I just stopped looking at it. Like I'm, I'm honestly, I'm, I'm done with it because it, um, like I still see the amount of likes a post gets, but there's just so much more information on the inside. It's like, how many people saved it? How many impressions did you get? How much reached? How far did it go? Sure. And, um, it is just, um, you know, that type of information can lead you too far into just um, what I call writing hits. Like, yeah. you know, what's popular and you know, what'll just, you know, but it, but if you just write what's popular, then you'll lose your sort of sense of like, you know, why it is that you got popular in the first place as an individual, as a creative artist. And I try to, you know, there's nothing wrong with writing the occasional hit, but at the same time, you want to write, you know, have the courage to write the thing that's going to get, you know, like 40,000 less likes, but it means a lot to you and leave it up there. How, how correlated are those for you? So like the, let, let's say the work that you're most proud of, like the, the, where you're like that, that, that hit something like it, it, I was really visited by something that day, or I really got where I wanted. How correlated is what you think your best is versus what is, your most popular or shared? Yeah, sometimes it's very correlated. Sometimes like the ones that I'm like, man, this is, I'm so glad that came through. I was able to capture that, write it down. Um, and it'll get, you know, like over a hundred thousand likes. And then other times I'll write something that I'm like, this is important. Like I remember this one particular message um, that I, I try to write about a lot. It's um, the way that my ego wants other people to think and act just like me. Sure. Um, you know, and this is something that we see in each other all the time. And if you do not adhere to the way that I see things and I think you are an enemy or something like yeah. that. So I tried to put that out and, um, it just, it falls flat because the message is just like either a little too raw or I haven't figured out how to say it right, but that'll get like, you know, like 30,000 likes or something like that. It is, it is weird. You, you realize very quickly that, uh, if you, it's obviously more popular to tell people what they want to hear versus totally. what you want to say. And sometimes those things are aligned and sometimes they're mm -hmm. not, but you, yeah, it's like, what did you become an artist for? Is it to, is it to service an algorithm or is it to service some idea of truth? And I think that that's, that's a tough decision for people to make because you are choosing in some cases to put things out there in the world that you know are not going to be popular or that they're not inherently as shareable or spreadable because they are challenging or uncomfortable or, or unpleasant. Yeah. And I think honestly, what I've learned over time is that when you do share sort of the, sort of these deeper um, truths that are hard to receive um, that are unpopular, your serious fans, the ones who go out there, who buy your books, who pre-order it, like they, you get credibility, you sure. know, because you're not just like touting to like, you know, what you said, feeding the algorithm and just trying to reach beyond your own audience. And instead you're like, okay, let's go deeper. Let's, let's talk about the things that are harder to, to really accept about ourselves. And um, I think it's, it's powerful to be able to sort of bounce between the two because then you don't lose yourself. And that's, that's pretty important to me. Yeah, I think I think that's right. And 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 once you're sort of freed from the fact that you're once once success or like sort of external recognition uh and what you're proudest of are decoupled, you have this sort of freedom. Mark Cerilis in one of my favorite passages in meditations, he says, you know, um uh ambition is tying your success to what other people say and do. 
And he says, sanity is tying it to your own actions. And so I think there's, it's like when you realize like, hey, I worked the hardest on this this thing and it did the worst. And then this thing was this kind of flit of inspiration or a guess, or I didn't think it would do that well. And then it did 10X what I (laughs) normally do. You're just sort of like, there's almost like a freedom and an empowerment in that uh, William Goldman, the screenwriter says, nobody knows anything. If you go, nobody knows anything, any chance of guessing what will and won't do well is probably a fool's errand. So just do what you think is best, do what you think is best, is the way to do it. That's I, th- I find that to be very freeing. I don't know if oh, you agree. And, and it really is because you kind of, you don't know. Like you put something out there, you write mm-hmm. something, an essay, whatever it is, and and you're sometimes shocked by the results that it's like, wow, this hit. And then a lot of things align, you know, a lot, not only is the quality of the content good, but the topic match with the day, you know, whereas like also thinking about in terms of like where people are in the day of the week where like, you know, there's more sort of inspirations on Monday and Wednesday, Thursday, you realize that like the week's been tough and writing about, you know, overcoming that difficulty. And, um, you know, Fridays, people generally will, will be thinking about their communities and their family members and their friends. So, um, posting about like good relationships and whatnot on those days. So you can kind of like, you know, you can learn from where we are, especially by the way, capitalism has assigned the week. Yeah. And, and look like, uh, most of the things that matter in life can't be measured. Right. Yeah. And so, uh, when you realize that it's, it's quite freeing because like, how, why is it, why is a poem a success? Because it did a hundred thousand likes or shares or whatever. And then one does a thousand, but it saves somebody from suicide or, totally. or it sets up some b- creative breakthrough for yourself or, or it's the one that somebody who becomes a close friend discovers you through. Like all the things that really matter in life can't be measured. There's the, uh, from the little prince, you know, um, what is it? Um, uh, uh, only with the heart can, can one see, right? Like, uh, the, the, the basically, uh, what is it? What is it? Invisible. Th- Let me pull it up. Invisible. Yeah. yeah. The I, uh, St. Exuberi. Um, he says, it is only the heart is only with the heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eyes, right? It's like the, the things that you are actually trying to accomplish in writing or art or with basically anything in life, you know, it's almost unquantifiable. It's ineffable. So the idea that like, some number of hearts or shares or retweets <laughs> is going to capture whether it was a success or not is impossible. It's insane. You know, it's funny that I think the real measurement of success, I have like these two that kind of stand out for me personally, is when I have a book out, if it's good enough for you to gift it to a friend. Yes. That's when I'm like, dang, I'm like, that was good. Like, you know, we did a good job and that's unquantifiable. I don't know how many times that happens, but I'll, I'll see it a number of times through people sharing stories and you know, someone saying, thank you, I got this from so-and-so. And to me, it's like, that's that's really powerful. And the, the other side of it is, too, is when you share things, like, it's always great occasionally when, like, a celebrity shares some of your work or they share yeah. one of your books, but it's not it's not Kim Kardashian who's making you famous. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's actually the person who has 200 followers. Because sure. if they share your work and they're like, this is good, their friends are going to really listen to them. Like their friends, their family, they're going to be like, whoa, I'm going to check this out. And that has a way bigger impact than someone who has millions and hundreds of millions of followers. Yeah, although sometimes I'll take it like, uh, you know, someone, let's say famous or important will like the book. And it's like, okay, that there's a certain quantifiableness to the impact there. But then to me, the other thing is like, okay, I thought what I was saying was true in my experience. And then this person has spent 20 years in combat and it's true in their experience too, or this person was in a concentration camp or this, you know, and you're like, like, again, how do you quantify? It's not even validation, but it's like the, the proof that you tapped into something true, that the work actually was good. It's same. It's equally true. You hear someone, you're like, you know, this got me through my cancer diagnosis or my divorce or the loss of a child. And you're just like, yeah, how many copies is is standing up for that person worth? Is it a thousand? Is it ten thousand? It's it's definitely more than one, you know. And and you can't measure that, and that's not going to be captured in you know hitting the list in a given week. Um, 
And I guess the Stokes would say it, it, it's all an external. It doesn't matter, but it does mm-hmm. matter. Like mm-hmm. to, when you do something for someone, when your work is of service, that's that's the most valuable metric that there is. Yeah, and I think um, I mean you're you're making me uh, think too because I've been so I've been following your work for a long time, and I've been coming from this background of Burmese Buddhist meditation that I've taken really seriously. And it shocks me, you know, the things that you share, the things that I've read from your books, how there is this powerful alignment in the truths that keep reoccurring over and over. We're talking about, you know, understanding the fleeting quality of life, understanding not to be dominated by external situations, understanding the power of equanimity. You know, like I see this, like you, 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 you know, the way that you write about this, it's like, so to me, it shines a light that thus, like, uh, those of us who seek wisdom, like we're sort of heading in the right direction, even, even though we're coming at it from, you know, different time periods, different cultures. And it's, uh, to me, it's, uh, it's inspiring to me that we're, yeah, we're moving in a similar direction. That, that, that's something I get so much fulfillment out where like you're researching something and then you find a connection between two like unrelated schools or you find mm-hmm. two people who never met, who lived thousands of years apart <laughs> uh, and had very different experiences saying fundamentally the same thing. You're like, oh, wow. Okay. This, there's some truth here. There's some independently discovered, uh, uh, pre-existing truth that's going on here and like I'm sure you found that too, where like you found some way that some words rhymed or an observation in one of your poems, and mm-hmm. then you found it in another poem or a very similar. And you're like, "Oh, this is a human thing. I found <laughs> this is a very human. I tapped into something fundamentally human here. Maybe I can't use it because someone else used it, or maybe I can. But but like, okay, this is a core human truth here that we're we're both touching on." Yeah, and it's it's powerful too because like that means that those of us who even aspire to developing a life where there is the potential for happiness, the potential for peace, the potential for mental clarity, it's like okay, if we have those things as our ideals, then on the way to achieving them and developing them, these truths will reoccur. And it's yeah. like no matter where you're coming from, it's like okay, if you really want to, um, you know, have peace, then you need to deal with your reactiveness. You need yeah. to deal with how intensely you're reacting to the outside world and realize that your perception and your reaction are being created by your own mind. And these things are just, yeah, it, it wows me a bit. Yeah, it's like in, in True Detective, you know, he's quoting Nietzsche, time is a flat circle, which is in Ecclesiastes, which is uh, in uh, the Stoics. And you're just like, okay, this idea, it, it, not just it, it's true that history is the same thing, happening over and over again, mm-hmm. uh, this idea of the thing, things happen over and over again. But then also us discovering that history is the same thing happening over and over again, <laughs> that there are these elements of recurrence, that is in and of itself a recurrence, right? Like mm-hmm. each generation, mm-hmm. each philosophical school, each religious tradition sort of gets under the hood and is like, yeah, this is how stuff works. I'm curious for you, like when did Stoicism become this like um, central point of your life? Like, what, did you study in high school? Did you go to a classics school or no? No, definitely not. I was in I was in college and I got introduced to uh, Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius and it sort of hit me like this ton of bricks. And it's funny. Do I, do I have it here? This is my, this is my uh, very old copy with nice. lots of notes. Um, it's like 16 or 17 years old now. Uh, it definitely put some miles on it. But I think, um, you know, what I, what I think, what I think is cool about Stoicism is it kind of it seeps into you, right? Um, have you ever read any Heraclitus, the the poet? No, I was, you would I like he's this down. sort of Greek mystic poet. He he does these kind of short epigrams. Actually, let me let me see if I have them within reach. Oh man, I wish I could. I wish I could read you some. Oh, here they are. Uh, these these are very Instagrammy poems that he has. Um, uh, let's see. From the strain of binding opposites comes harmony. Uh, the harmony past knowing sounds more deeply than the know. Uh, what else do we got? Um, the sun, timekeeper of the day and season, oversees all things. Uh, his, his famous line is uh, that no man steps in the same river twice. Um, oh, the biggest, that, yeah, the biggest yeah. truth. That's the, the foundational 
thing that made um, Herman Hesse's Siddhartha work. That was yes. like the key, the key truth. Yeah. So, so again, there's one of those ideas that somebody has at some point and then it gets into the ether and then is independently discovered and rediscovered. But um, I think each time I, I read the Stoics, I come back and I get something new out of them. Right. So like what I was looking for when I was 19 was advice about purpose and resilience and, mm -hmm. you know, self-sufficiency and all these things. And then, then I'm rereading it in the middle of a pandemic and I'm thinking about justice, I'm thinking about connection, I'm thinking about mortality, because now I'm 15 years older, the world is falling apart, I have children, I, you know, the, mm -hmm. who you are when you pick up the work, you, you get something different out of it each time. And so my journey of sort of with the Stoics, like, I think people think about these things as this like epiphany, you know, uh, the, the, this moment on the road to Damascus. And there is that, I think, but there's also, it's more of a seeping, gradual thing. It gets into your blood and it changes you. I think great art, great work, great insights, that, that's what they do. I think um, what I'm wondering too, right? So I, I, from what I've observed of the mind, right, it's incredibly malleable and that, um, you know, it carries so much heavy conditioning that over time, we don't even realize how much we're accumulating. You know, we'll, we'll yes. react with anger over and over and over again. And obviously that makes it easier to then react with anger in the future. Sure. But when you make that break from the past and whatever it is that's inspiring, inspiring you to, to do better, um, whatever method, I think one thing that sort of stands mm -hmm. true along many methods is that repetition is key. It's yes. like you just you just have to try again and again and again. And over time, you'll build new positive habits, new conditioning that actually supports your happiness and your freedom. Yeah. The Stokes talk about fueling the habit bonfire. Like what nice. what fire yeah. are you fueling? Right. The good habit or the bad habit, the the you you want to be or the you that you're ashamed of being. And I think that's right. You get stronger as you go. And the more you set up routines and structures, we, we're talking about hitting the bestseller list. Like if, if, if you have a routine or a structure, they're like, this is what I do every day, whether that's you hitting number one or undeservedly not appearing on the list, you know what you're supposed to be doing. And that, you know, that's the bonfire I think you want to be fueling. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting too, because when I, when I go to these, so I've started going to these longer meditation courses where I, go away for 30, 45 days. Um, and it's, you know, you're in total silence and you're meditating with, um, you know, my wife and I were usually the youngest ones that go. Um, and we have about 10 years of experience. We are meditating with people who've been doing this since the seventies. And I just, I come out of it realizing that what I did was I just sent myself to the mental gym. You yeah. Know, I'm just at the gym. Like I'm, I'm working on my mind, teaching myself how to be equanimous, bringing myself back to the present moment and developing compassion for myself and all people. And it's literally like, it's just repetition. It's trying it over and over and over again. Yeah, you, it, you do it until it becomes muscle memory. And that, yep. I think that's, you know, for, for the Stoics, there wasn't this meditative practice, but there was the journaling practice. And so, mm. you know, people will look at meditations and so, some, some uh, sort of uh, translators and academics have been like, it's not a work of great philosophy because it, it's repetitious, that it, he repeats himself. He, he doesn't really say anything new. And it, it's, this is to miss the point of what he's doing, which is sitting yeah. down and practicing. It's like, that's like listening to a musician do their scales and be like, well, they're just doing the same thing over and over again. That's what they're doing. That's the whole point. But from the repetition of the scales comes a sort of intuitive knowledge a sense of how things go that then allows the Im the endless combinations of improvisation or new mm -hmm. creations from from that uh, that work. I think too, and 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 there's a lot of works like that in like the ancient world too, where they're so repetitive, and they're for multiple reasons. They're like you know to help people remember it as an oral tradition, and also yes. to um, to highlight the tiny differences like yes. to highlight the tiny evolutions because then it just like, boom, it's like, Oh, something changed. And it's like, what was it? And it just makes it so clear. And it's like, Oh, this is, this is what, this is what's important. Well, I had another question for you about your writing process. So it must be weird also like, okay, your, your traditional poet would have had to, you know, collect their poems. Maybe they're occasionally publishing them in newspapers or privately. 
and then uh, you know, then they're saving them up for a book. Like you have the ability to to just sort of write them and put them out like today or tomorrow. You could you could mm -hmm. put them out like this, and you, there's no editor between you. And this is all wonderful and empowering. But how do you cultivate a kind of a discipline that that self a self discipline that is able to determine what is good enough to be published or not? Right? Like like how do you how do you decide like um, especially because your work is so short, I imagine you could do a poem in 10 seconds. You could be like, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. but how do you, t how do you know, like, this is how long it takes to work on this one. This is how long it takes to get it right. And even though there's only 11 words in this poem, here's how I'm confident they're the 11 right words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. I think, um, it's a mixture of two things. It's one of it is, the uh, the muscle memory of having been, uh, you know, spent the last uh, eight years of my life just focusing on writing sure. where I've, I've seen poems fall flat and I've seen other ones like rise and connect with people. So I spent a lot of time, you know, especially in the beginning when I was much more minimalistic in my writing. Now I'm a lot more wordy because I'm just giving myself the space. But um, I, you know, would spend a lot of time writing out what, what's the message? Because to me, the message always feels more important than craft you know like i'm not like a literary poet i what, what matters to me is are you understanding what i'm saying in terms sure. of like personal transformation or relationships um so i would spend time just crossing words out like i would you know write write a poem and i would see like okay what was superfluous like what am you know am i using the word that too much and just like sure. scratching things out to make it clean and there's a feeling that i've developed where it's like you know, I look at it, read it over and over, make sure there's no mistakes. And then it kind of just clicks inside of me. That's like, okay, this is, this is ready to put out there. And, um, I think that's been like a sort of, a like intuitive muscle memory development that I developed over time with, with just knowing like what, um, is worth putting out there and what's not. And I, I feel like I've been really, the reason I took to Instagram in the beginning anyways, was because I knew that the topics that I was writing about um, like wellness in the world of wellness wasn't as developed as it is now. And sure. I knew that, an, you know, a publisher would, wouldn't be interested in my manuscript. So I thought to myself, let me see if I can even connect with people and yeah. then I'll worry about a publishing deal later. And that's what ended up happening was people came first and then publishers came after that. Well, I imagine again, it re must require some discipline for you. I think there's a part of every creator that that loves the validation, that loves the the love from the audience. And so knowing that, hey, it's Tuesday, I'm not feeling that great about myself, I could bang out a poem and publish it and get flooded with comments and likes, that is more rewarding and, uh, you know, uh, ego fulfilling than saying, no, I'm going to spend six hours moving seven words around in this one and not publish, right? So <laughs> I imagine that the discipline of not the discipline of not shipping yet because it's not where it needs to be, I think is an underrated skill. Totally. And, and, you know, I'll find myself, especially with pieces that I find that are really important. Um, cause lately I've been doing a lot of essay writing, but with the essay writing, I'll normally connect it with some short poem that captures yeah. the main message of it. But, and that's, what's cool about be, the new book. Yeah. There, there will be like ideas, um, that will just marinate in my mind for like two months before yeah. they're even ready to like sometimes even put pen to paper. And then after that, it's like, okay, let me like, does this, does this have rhythm? Like, is this, is this really, does it make sense yet? But there are a lot of important pieces to me that it literally took two, three months to write. And I've been fortunate too. Like I've been um, like pretty prolific. Like I write a lot. Um, I've been writing a lot over the past eight years. So what I try to do now that I have these um, three books and I'm working on two more, I, you know, will share something new in the morning if something new has come up or something that I've written that I, that I like, or I'll just, you know, pick from the old, like old pieces that I've written and just feel, um, feel out the day and connect with, you know, put out there whatever feels right for this random Thursday. Yeah. 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 The, the, the yeah. discipline, to insist on your own standards, even when the audience might accept less or the market might accept less or your ego would accept less. 
is a uh, is a very hard thing. And it's tempting. The market will accept very less, you know, yes. very, very less. Like <laughs> yeah, it, what's yeah. popular, like it's it's incredible how, you know, we can just um, there's there's just a lot of like mimicking of a particular idea that happens on the Internet. Sure. And um, and everyone will get, you know, X amount of likes. So to have to restrain from that, to, to just make myself not just fall into what's popular, but just fall into like trying to create work that's um, more evergreen as opposed to like, you know, 2020 boundaries are really popular. So everyone's yeah. writing about boundaries, you know? Oh, well, I, I, um, I, I connected with something you said a few minutes ago, which is you're saying that, you know, your poems used to be shorter and now they're a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. Um, I think about that too. Whether, and I go back and forth, whether it's a, uh, an example of dip, discipline or ill discipline. Like when I look at, um, each one of my my sort of stoic inspired books. So if I go obstacle, ego, stillness, courage, and discipline, each one of those is a little bit longer than the one that came oh, before. Interesting. It. Yeah. And like uh, obstacle is the shortest of all of them. And during the pandemic, I was reading them again. Um, I, I read uh, some of them to my youngest son, and I there there was a part of me that was like, oh man, there's like an authentic an authenticity and a rawness and a and it get to the pointness yeah. of, of this that I want to get back to. But then there was another part of me that was like, the reason I can't write this short anymore is that it's not honest. I'm, yep. I am, I was saying things that were true, but was not the fuller picture. And now I have a fuller understanding of the nuances of that idea. And I would never say it that way now. And so I go back and forth between, am I being, not disciplined or too disciplined. Like, I don't like that I'm getting longer in the tooth each time. And yet I'm also insisting on a higher standard of truth. And that's why I'm, it's requiring more words to say the same thing. Do you think about that? (laughs) Yeah, totally, man. Cause I've noticed that after I put out inward, which was like inward was like hyper minimalism, you know, I was really, really pushing it. Um, And then clarity and connection was like, just it was wordier. I mean, I think it had like ten thousand more words than N word, and but I realized that when I was wrapping up clarity and connection, I was like, oh, I'm not as interested in writing poetry. Like I just I felt this shift happen inside me, and I wanted to start writing essays. Like I was like, yeah. I want to write essays. I want to like pick a topic and just put everything together that I that's coming up for me in that moment about that topic, and. I had this like kind of back and forth for a while because I was like, oh, you know, like I'm I'm known as a poet. I should keep writing poetry. But it was I, I landed on let me just be true to myself. Like in this moment, I don't want to write a lot of poetry, but I do want to write a lot more. I want to write paragraphs. I want to write essays. I want to just um, go deeper on all of these topics that I've been talking about for the past few years and letting myself do that. I mean, it helped create lighter and it um I think it's just more the direction that I'm moving in now. And I'm just kind of letting myself evolve as a writer because I think it's um, like I owe it to myself to just do what I enjoy. So um, we, we opened, we were talking about bestseller lists and accomplishments and the feelings. Uh, and I was thinking as we were talking about it, um, have you read, have you heard the poem, The Moment by Margaret Atwood? No. She, no. you know, she wrote the Handmaiden's Tale, but she did this poem. Mm-hmm. I want, I want, I, I, I do love poetry, so I want to read this to you and tell me yes, if you think please. it jives with your experience. Okay, she says, "The moment when, after many years of hard work and a long voyage, you stand in the center of your room, house, half acre, square mile, island, country, knowing at last how you got there, and say, I own this." Is the same moment the trees unloose their soft arms from around you, the birds take back their language, the cliffs fissure and collapse, the air moves back from you like a wave and you can't breathe. No, they whisper, you own nothing. You were a visitor time after time, climbing the hill, planting the flag, proclaiming, we never belonged to you. You never found us. It was always the other way around. I I definitely definitely connect with that because it's um you know I I try to stay away from lofty titles like yeah even her saying like right I don't pointing out we don't own this it's yeah. this there's this temporary thing that's happening like in this moment I am sort of immersed in these ideas and a vessel you know yeah totally it feels like a vessel and and there are definitely a lot of times where poems would just totally appear they would just pop up into the head and. 
Other times I would ask myself, what am I learning? And I'll put it together in words, but, you know, not thinking of myself as the owner and also not thinking of myself as a teacher, I think has been fundamental um, to my inner and outer success. Um, Because I think a lot of times when we're on social media, like just because you have, you sold X number of books, you're on the New York Times bestseller and you're like, you know, do all these, these accomplishments, but people will put you on a pedestal that you yourself do not put yourself on. Yeah. And it's an interesting situation where I, obviously I can't control how people perceive me. Like their perceptions are dependent on their own, their, their own emotional history, how they feel in the current moment. So there's a lot of filters that go through before they make up their idea of you. But on the other end, um, I think positioning myself in my own mind as a student, as an explorer has been much healthier because I'm not the end all be all, right? Like I'm thinking of myself as like, you know, as if I know everything, like I know I don't know everything. I'm very aware of how unwise I am. I'm very aware of how like middle of the road I am, you know? So even when I decided to even take writing seriously, I, I felt intuitively it was like, right, like write about the fact that healing is even possible. Like I, that was, that bewildered me so much. And I felt that, um, that I, I knew, I knew that I wasn't totally healed. I knew I wasn't totally wise. I knew that I was on my way, but it was okay. It was okay to share reflections. It was okay to potentially help someone turn that lens inward the way I have. And hopefully they benefit from observing themselves. Yeah. And and also this idea that we don't own any of this stuff in the sense that like you have the number one spot for a week. Right. And then, (laughs) then somebody else owns it. Right. Like I had, I had it for a month, uh, for a week in September, 2019. And you know who took it from me? Donald Trump Jr. So it's not worth that much (laughs) to begin with either. Right. Like, like it's, it's this transitory thing. All of it is right. You, your name is on the door of the office. You're the, the owner of this stock or this company, or, you know, you are, you are the legal, uh, uh, recognized spouse of so-and-so, but it's Mm -hmm. all ephemeral and transitory and either it gets taken from you, it disappears or you die, right? Yeah. Or it dies. That that is that. And, and the second you have told yourself that you own it, I think the Stokes would say is when you've made yourself most vulnerable. Because now you're going to be crushed when it's taken away. You're going to feel like you've been wronged in some way, as opposed to I think the more gracious approach, which is, you know, I can't believe they they let me put my my nameplate here on this spot for one week or yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, the the best the best way i heard uh, someone describe like your house is they say you don't own your house the bank just lets you make payments on it for a while <laughs> i think you're hitting at the key the key um you know there was a i think in when buddhism came to the west there was a mistranslation of uh the word uh, crave. So they, they use the word desire. Desire is the root of suffering. And, um, mm-hmm. but, uh, my teacher at San Cuenca, he, he says craving is the root of suffering. And yes. I was able to connect with that so much more because from, and it's often also said, you know, attachment is the root of suffering, but it's really yes. where are these attachments coming from? They're coming from our craving. And what's the difference between desire and craving? Tension. There's tension there. There's this mm-hmm. sort of tense manner of trying to approach a situation and when we think about it right we're not monks we're householders so it's fine for you to have goals it's fine for you to like build a you know a home for your sure. for your family to have a car to like you know just develop things in a way where you are taking care of your responsibilities and it's fine to have those things as goals but when you start going too far and wrapping up these desires, these goals with tension, and they just become these cravings that are just basically causing you tons of misery in your own mind. And then when you don't get these things, or they get taken away, or what you thought was true is revealed as an illusion that you thought you own things, then you just explode into greater suffering. And I, I think that's what Atwood is saying in that poem. She's saying that it's like, it's the moment when you say this is mine, that's when life has to remind you. You know, she says, uh, when, when, uh, when you say that I own this is the same moment the trees unloose their soft arms around you. It's like when when you have the arrogance to say this is mine, it's forever, I own this, no one can take this away from me. That's when life has to almost... Uh, 
takes it upon itself to, to, to disabuse you of that notion, to remind you who's really in charge. So there's almost a, I think even an element of tempting fate when we, when we believe like, this is mine, this is who I am, this says something about me. I think that that poem also points to like the, you know, abundance entering your life. It kind mm -hmm. of requires a very light mind. Like yes. a mind that's not just like gripping. Cause like, what is attachment? You saying this is mine. Your mind literally is just like gripping this story. And yeah. then I don't know. I feel like the wisest people that I've met, the most peaceful people, the kindest people, like their minds are very light. You know, there's, there yeah. isn't, there isn't hate there. There's just this openness and that openness of letting go of being able to embrace this moment and then also watch it pass is um it's, it's very inviting and it's inviting and invites success too yeah and i think uh, going back to the bestseller list where we were it's like do you see this as this thing that you have to protect and fight for all the time or do you go i've done it now now i don't need to do it again you know now i don't I like i i have it forever it's a it's a memory like it, it's a memory that you know they you can lose your printout of the paper but it doesn't change the fact that for that one week, it was there. Like, nothing, like I, I think about this as a parent, the most haunting thing to consider ever is that you, you lose your children. Mm -hmm. and, and it's true. Life can, can, things can take them away. Death, the government, a bomb, you know, whatever. Um, but nothing can take away having had them, right? And so how do yeah. you think, do you, do you think about, you know, what you want to have in the future? Um, or do you think about the present moment that you have now and the joy and happiness that it's already brought you, uh, which nothing can dislodge from you, you know, short of dementia or your own death. Yeah, I, I mean, the thing that you're pointing to, too, I've been realizing a lot lately where impermanence has been my greatest teacher. Like, yeah. it's by far, like, I'm just always going back to this idea of impermanence. And it's really shown me that you know, earlier, before I really started trying to develop my own self-awareness, I was just absent from life. And I was absent from the people that I really love, from the people that, you know, I want to be spending time with. And as I started attuning myself to impermanence and the fact that things are so fleeting and that you just don't know when they'll really radically change, it's helped me just be there, like spend more time, intentional time with my wife, to be there with my parents and just give them my intention as opposed to just scrolling on my phone when I'm sitting next to them, you know? Totally. And I think there's just, um, if you are able to really embrace the fact that um, everything is impermanent to really embrace change itself, it'll just allow you to be so much more present in life. And at the same time, when things get difficult, you know that you can weather the storm because it's impermanent. Like it's not going to be stormy forever. It's just going to be another passing situation. But in both cases, I think impermanence just like, helps you step up as the best version of yourself in life. Yeah, we're scared about potentially losing something in the future that we are taking for granted right now. Right now, yeah. And we're also, when we think about impermanence, we think about it in a negative connotation. We're always afraid that it's going to take things away. Yeah. But you don't realize that if the entire universe was static, nobody would exist. If like yeah. the universe is fundamentally based on movement, like, mm -hmm. you know, atomic movement, mental movement, physical movement, it's all, um, it needs movement for us to even have the opportunity to exist. So in a lot of ways, I feel grateful that this universe is like fundamentally impermanent and dependent on change because you and I wouldn't even be having this conversation right now if we, if change wasn't possible. Well, that, I think this is why you're going to like Heraclitus for sure. And I think you're going to see that you guys have been unconsciously tapping into a similar river. Nice. Um, but, but Marcus really says this in meditation too. He says, look, everything in life comes from change. Your birth, you're afraid of death because it's a change, but mm. your birth was a change. You didn't exist. And then you were brought into being and that everything good in your life it, we're afraid of change, and yet everything good in your life also came from change, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And when I was, when I was, um, I was really sort of happy that this one, like, I wrote a long essay about that, about how we shouldn't be fearing change, that it should inspire us, and that we should also realize that it's brought us everything that we love, everything that yeah. we find beautiful in life. And um, I was hitting hard at it in an essay, and I, I had no idea how, uh, you know, people were going to respond to it, but I sent it out on my Substack, and 
man, the reshares that that thing got, it was all over the internet. And I was like, wow, I'm really yeah. glad that I stayed true to what, what, what was important to me in this moment that just kept coming up. And I love that Marcus Aurelius was hitting at this thousands of years ago. Well, and, and even if, uh, even if change wasn't good, not liking it or fearing it, isn't going to stop it. So no. you're just torturing yourself. Totally, totally. And I even think in terms of like our personal identity, right? Like who, how you see yourself as an individual to allow yourself to move with the river of change, to allow your interests, your likes or dislikes to also evolve. I, it feels really valuable because if you try to move against this like forward flowing river of change, if you try to move against nature, it's just going to hurt. That's right. That's right. Man, this is beautiful. Well, I, I love the books and uh, I love what you're doing. And the, this conversation was amazing. Yeah, thank you so much. It's so good to finally be in contact. Really grateful. Likewise. And congrats again.